just reading some news. Google is limiting the amount of space you get on Google Drive. Kind of crazy. Thought they were the bottomless pit, but I guess not. Yeah, um, uh, they it used to be unlimited for uh, like academia, for example, and now they're making it a hundred terabytes, and they're giving everybody a year, a little more than a year, to shrink down or start paying extra. And they also took out the uh, the limits on, on audio. Oh, you know, it is a business and going completely unlimited doesn't bring as much money until you start limiting folks. So it makes sense that they're trying to find ways to make more money. Right. Well, it's 218. Waited for people to show. I say let's get started. So welcome to module number five. We have passed the quarter of the class. Moving on to the second quarter. Time is flying. As always for this class, a picture for the week. And now this module focuses on network-based attacks and what they, how they function in a very a high level. Your lab will deal with more in-depth uh, analysis. And actually, it's one of, one of my more favorite labs to do in the class. So networking-based attacks beginning with interception with the most infamous of them all, the man in the middle. It involves an attacker inserting themselves into a conversation between two parties. The actor will impersonate both parties to gain access to the information being sent. And neither legitimate party is aware of this happening. The tool of choice for many for this is EtherCap, usually done in a local network, they will simulate an access point or simulate the switch or the router and get the victim systems to connect to them and through them uh, pass packets on. Uh, it is it's not that hard to deploy in uh, V4 networks. V6, a little bit harder because uh, IPv6 doesn't use ARP but it is much easier to deploy in, in V4 networks. There is of course man in the browser. And honestly, any anything that is listening in between to legitimate will be a man in the, and then whatever. Uh, so like man in the middle, man in the browser, man in the network, there's all kinds of those. So just understand that the, the man in the, uh, section is just intercepting. So for example, man in the browser is uh, exactly that. The attacker intercepts and manipulates communication between a browser and the security mechanism of the computer. For example, through 
a Trojan browser extension uh, through any add-ons uh, or through forcing the browser to use a more insecure format like HTTP. Uh, man in the middle resides exclusively in the browser and that may make it hard for standard antiviruses to detect. It also means that there is a big uh, emphasis on browsers because a lot of things are occurring through them. Since we use a lot of services now through these browsers, they are a program that US security professionals should be keenly aware of. A replay is a variation on the man in the middle. Replay attacks will make a copy of a legitimate transmission like a packet before sending it to the recipient, sending it at a later time. A simple replay would involve capturing logon credentials between a computer and a server. When the session ends, the replay would be used to log on. Although cryptography can be used to thwart a replay attack, there are many instances in which cryptographic communications can be manipulated. An attacker could capture an administrative message sent from an approved network device to a server and use that to breach a service. Replays can be prevented with random keys valid for a limited amount of time using timestamps in all messages and other methods. So for example, Windows falls uh, prey to this because like we saw the other week, it is very easy to replicate a Windows password. So if you can grab the hash, you grab the, that message being sent, it is a piece of cake it, to save it and resend it on the network later. And as long as the Windows server doesn't think anything's different, then it'll easily approve and let it go on. Don't you love Windows? Another type of network-based attack is poisoning. Starting with the old ARP spoofing. Like I said, the tool EdderCap does this just fine where it will start telling other devices on the network, I am this IP address and this is the MAC address for it in order to trick other systems on the network to update their tables and start sending traffic another way. So instead of it going, for example, from A to B, as it should, the attacker will modify both the ARP tables through just flooding the network until they, until they update, and then they'll start sending traffic through the attacker. Now, ARP attacks can be fixed by rebooting the system because ARP tables are stored in RAM. So if you are, if you ever think your local network may be compromised and your data is being sent uh, another way because your, your ARP table was, was poisoned, just restart. That'll clear the table. DNS is another poisoning it substitutes fraudulent IP addresses from the symbolic names. They can occur, DNS poisoning can occur in two locations, locally in the host table or on a DNS server. Every single device that connects to a network has to have a host file, which in anything Unix related will be an Etsy host for anything Windows related will be in the Windows folder, System32, Drivers, Etsy, and then there'll be the host folder. You have to be a super user to change that file. External DNS works not by attempting to break into the system, but exploiting a protocol flaw and convince the authentic DNS service to accept fraudulent entries. If the DNS server does not validate those entries, it'll store them and then distribute them out to legitimate users, thus poisoning not only itself, but also poisoning all the other devices on the network. Sadly, a lot of DNS systems aren't built to be secure, so they'll accept fraudulent connections 
uh, fraudulent records and spew those out to legitimate users and cause mayhem everywhere. Another is privilege escalation. This attack exploits vulnerabilities in software to gain access to resources that a user normally would be restricted from accessing. One type of this is the vertical privilege escalation, which you see here. If a malicious person logs in as a user or a service user, they will do their best to work their way up to NT authority or to root and gain full access to the entire a system. There's also horizontal privilege escalation where if one user doesn't work, maybe I'll try another user and maybe through that user, I'll gain enough privileges to work my way up. This, this happens with systems that share resources, allowing an attacker to move from one system to another until they find a way to escalate vertically. One common way of attacking a server is through denial of service. Denial of service is really an annoyance. I tend to do this whenever I do uh, career days at elementary schools where I'll ask for two students from the, the group to stand up in front of the class. And then I have the entire class tell the two students who are standing with me three sentences at the same time. And the two students who are standing there with me have to capture as many sentences and say them back once everybody is done saying their three sentences. Now kids being kids, they understand that they want their sentence to be the one remembered and said back. So, you know, it, takes a, a split second for them to realize I need to be louder than everybody else in the class so that my sentences are heard. And it just becomes one big loud noise for a good couple seconds as all the kids try to yell their, their sentence above all everyone else. And the poor kids who stand in the front just take the full brunt of this. And then when I ask them, well, what did you hear? They typically say nothing. Or they'll <laughs> or they'll hear uh, or they'll say whatever was the very last sentence spoken after everybody else spoke. That is basically Deanna, uh, denial of service. It's just an overwhelming of high volume of bogus requests that a system just can't respond to legitimate requests as it's trying to process the overwhelming high volume. There are some subcategories of DOS, like Smurf, where attackers broadcast a network request to multiple computers, but changes the address from which the request came to the victim's computer, making it appear as if it's asking for a response. Each of the computers then sends a response to the victim's computer so that it's quickly overwhelmed. There is the amplification, like Smurf, this attack floods an unsuspecting victim by redirecting valid responses to it by using publicly accessible and open DNS servers to flood a system with DNS response traffic. There is also SYN flood. Attacker sends a SYN segment or SYN packets to the server but modifies the source address of each packet to a computer address that does not exist or cannot be reached. The server continues to keep these sessions open and wait for a never coming response until it runs out of resources to respond to legitimate requests. Again, a DOS attack is just an annoyance. Legitimate users can't get through because all of the lines are busy. Hey, you know what's another DOS attack is everybody trying to get a vaccine and waiting on the phone line forever or waiting on sites who are being overwhelmed. Moving on, we're gonna spend most of our time this week 
on web server application attacks. Um, this one is an example of the cross-site scripting or XSS. Attackers take advantage of web applications that accept user input without validating it before presenting it back to the user. Attackers can trick valid websites into feeding malicious script into the web browser, which will be executed. There's also the cross-site request forgery or XSRF. This attack uses the browser settings to impersonate the user. By tricking the user who is already authenticated on a website to load another web page, the new page will inherit the identity and privileges of the victim to perform an undesired function on the attacker's behalf. There is also SQL injection. or as it's known, SQL I. Uh, this is the number one a type of attack, the number one issue with web server applications. The two that I just covered before are number seven. This is number one on the list. This attack inserts statements to manipulate a database server. SQL I introduces malicious commands for the server to run. You will be playing with SQL I this week. We also have things like hijacking, a session hijacking, which an attack attacker attempts to impersonate a user via stolen, uh, stolen session token. There's URL hijacking. Attackers purchase domains that are spelled similarly to actual sites in hopes that a user will mistype and go to their site. Domain hijacking using domain pointers that link a domain name to a specific web server changed by an attacker. And clickjacking, users trick into clicking a link that is other than what it appears to be. Adding on to the more ways things can get attacked. Buffer overflow, a process that attempts to store data in RAM beyond the boundaries of a fixed length storage buffer. Because running programs as buffer have a return address set, a buffer overflow can take that spot and run malicious code. For example, spewing out all the users that are logged in uh, or being able to read RAM and dump information. Uh, browsers, now browsers, because they are so highly utilized now, they have to, there has to be a lot more focus on them. And currently, we honestly have three browsers. We have Chrome and all of its family. We have Firefox and we have Safari. Those are the three main browsers because everybody else comes from them. So for example, Brave comes from Chrome, uh, Opera comes from Chrome, um, Chromium, Chrome, the, those, those spawn from that. Uh, Firefox has things like Ice Weasel and Tor and well, Safari, Safari. But these are really the three browsers that exist and everybody else uses their platforms, their engines to create whatever else they wanna add. So it's important to make sure that these browsers are up to date, that these browsers are doing what they should because it's very easy to run things like extensions uh, and plugins and add-ons that could end up hurting them, like running code that they shouldn't. and thus being a vector for attack and successful infiltration of a network. Are there any questions? Looking around, looking around. 
Okay. Make a quick video of this and then I'll explain the lab, which will take some setup this time. Oh, and uh, Cabrillo is also getting hit with that uh, that storage issue. I do have to find a new place to store my stuff. Oops. Because, uh, who did the math? There we go. 100 terabytes per organization ends up being, what, about 10 gigabytes a user? Yeah, I already eat two terabytes. Oops. I will upload this video. There we go, CIS 75, module five lecture. And we'll put it in the 75 playlist. Excellent. Okay, so this week, you are going to get hands-on into the world of web application uh, exploitation. In order to do this, you will need to use Burp Suite. You can do this on most OSs. The instructions I have here are for Windows, but don't feel that you have to do it on Windows. Uh, so this is what the lab says. You'll install, install Burp Suite. Again, you don't have to install it into Windows. You can install it wherever you want. It is a GUI-based tool, and you'll you'll use the the browser within in order to do the labs. The labs are all on the Web Security Academy, which I'll show you in just a bit. So the easiest thing is to use a VM because it's easy to throw away afterwards. Uh, the the regular E2 medium will be just fine. You want to make sure that you're using the one with desktop experience so you get a GUI. Then, of course, you'll do like you have already, where you'll set a Windows password. You'll log into the system. You'll go to local server and turn off the Internet Explorer enhanced security configuration. This is what allows you to download stuff um, without the error showing up. If you have set this up right, that's how IE should look. It should say it's not enabled. Then I suggest getting whichever browser you want because you'll need two browsers. Once you're in, and once you have downloaded your browser, then go to portswigger.net slash burp and download the free burp. You do not need to pay for burp. You can get the free, especially because you're starting to learn how to use this. There is no reason why anybody should spend any money. Download the latest version of burp, of course. And then you'll go through the process of installing it just like any usual program. The first time you run it, it'll ask you uh, what kind of project are we running. The defaults are perfectly fine. We're going to run a temporary project, and we're going to use the defaults. That's perfectly fine. And then within Burp, once it's fu fully running, you'll go under proxy, 
and you'll use the embedded browser. Now, let me switch my share. and show you the Web Security Academy. This is a great site. If you wanna get into web security, this is the place. You will need to uh, sign up, it's totally free. Once you're signed up, you'll be able to access the labs that go within. So for example, SQLi, it does have some learning, they'll have some videos to talk about. You'll see that so you can see some examples You'll read about it. You'll get down to this lab, for example. By clicking it, you will get to here where uh, you will do, for example, a SQL injection vulnerability. They give you the question. And then you click on this to access the lab. You should, yeah, you need to be logged in in order to access it. But once you're in, you can, you can figure out how to make this happen. If you get stuck, it's perfectly fine. You're learning this for the first time. Check out the solution. And then and then do the lab and get the, uh, the points for doing it. And then you move on to the next and move on to the next and so on and so forth. This is a whole lot of hands-on learning that will show you what this world entails. Now I mentioned uh, the OWASP top 10. These are the top uh, risks that exist for web applications. This hasn't changed since 2017. These same vulnerabilities exist in websites today. And the number one threat that exists, the number one risk that we have is still SQL injection. That's why it's on the list of things for you to learn because more, you know, you'll, you have a very good chance of on a website being able to, for that website to get breached through a SQL attack because it's the number one. Then number two is broken authentication. Number three, sensitive data exposure. Number four, XML, external entities, broken access control, security misconfiguration, cross-site scripting, insecure deserialization, components with known vulnerabilities, and logging and monitoring. These are the top 10 problems of most sites on the internet. So you'll get some hands-on experience into two of those. You'll go through, you'll go through them. Uh, you know, you'll knock out SQL I, uh, SQL Union, and uh, and the SQL injection attack, and then you'll do two for the cross-site scripting, and that will be your assignment for this week. Everything within the Web Security Academy, following two of the ten. Uh, most the highest security risk that exists on websites. Any questions? The Bay Area OWASP meetings are monthly. You can follow them on Meetup. There is one tonight about getting your, your security dream job. Highly suggest signing up and attending. Uh, if you have noticed in the class, there is a section for you to attend and get points for attending those meetings right here for OWASP and Pacific Hackers. I just decided on highlighting the security dream job because I think that that is, uh, I mean, they're all relevant, but you know, it, it's definitely an interesting talk.
So after, after doing this lab, if you feel web security is something you wanna do, well, let me tell you, you will have plenty of work in it and you would now have the place where you can train yourself to know and how to, how to do these and protect systems from these attacks. Uh, and I highly suggest joining OWASP as a member because that's what they focus on. Uh, but yeah, yeah, if this is your thing, you have a community already for you and places to start training. If this is not for you, well, at least you know, uh, you'll know about web security attacks and you'll have an idea on how to protect uh, your organization, your business, your own site from these attacks. Any other questions? Okay, well, as always, you know where to reach me if you have any questions on Discord. 